Good morning. Happy Fourth of July. Let's all stand. You're watching online. We're excited for you watching us. We're going to sing to our praises to our great and living God. Come on. Fourth of July weekend, everybody. It's going to be a beautiful sunny day tomorrow, right? Well, hey, if you're a current I just want you to close your eyes and put your hands out like this. And I just want to pray a blessing over you as you sing this next song. Father, I thank you we can come into a place every single week and praise your name and hear your message. 
and it's because of the men and women that have died for this country and continue to fight for the freedom to live in one of the greatest countries in the world to have the freedom of religion, the freedom of free speech, the freedom of rights, that we're able to come here and just to be in a safe place. So I pray for each person watching online and people in this building right now as they are getting ready to celebrate with their friends and family tomorrow, barbecues, fireworks, parades, all the great stuff that happens to celebrate independence, that you would just keep them safe. I pray a special blessing upon the, upon the fathers, that you just will encourage them, let them know, just like Pastor Matt talked about on Father's Day, that they are doing the best they can to be the fathers and the husbands. I pray for the moms. I pray for the single moms as well as they are just battling, raising kids on their own, that you will continue just to help them to provide for their, for their children, provide for their needs. Just pray a special blessing for everybody here. Let them know that they are loved and they are cherished by you. It says in your word that you know every single hair on top of our heads, that you knit us in our mother's womb. And we are special and we are loved. In Jesus' name. Face 
during this next song, we're going to receive communion together. And communion is the, really the remembrance of what Jesus did on the cross for us. And as we go into communion, when Jesus like celebrated this with his disciples at the Last Supper, he just grabbed the bread and he said, this is my body. It's broken for you. As often as you eat, remember me. And then he, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood. As often as you drink, remember me. And I, I like to think about, okay, what are you remembering that Jesus did? What is it that Jesus did for us on the cross? Jesus came to restore relationship between us and the Father. And today we're going to be talking about relationships. We're going to be talking about how he really has said, I want you to be people who reconcile the world to the Father. And we do that by also reconciling people to us, that we would bring re relationship back together. So as you receive communion this today, I want you to think about just relationships in your life. How are they going? What are some relationships that are good? Thank you, Lord, for those. What are some relationships that are not so good? Some relationships that need repair, that could actually use Jesus in the middle of them to bring reconciliation. And as you come and you get the elements, that you'd say, Jesus, you went so far to bring me back into relationship with you and the Father. Help me to know how I can be in the middle of the relationship that I'm in that's sideways and bring that back together. Give me ideas to where I can bring reconciliation in with the person in myself, with others in our family, and with you. So I'm just going to pray, and as we begin this next song, when you're ready, just slip out where you are, and you can come and get the elements. And then when you're ready to receive communion, you could do it by yourself. You could do it with people you came with. I'm going to say, Jesus, how do I bring reconciliation in relationship. So, Father, we love you, and we need you. And I pray, Father, that you would help us to be people who bring reconciliation, God, to each other, um, to family relationships, between you and them, between you and us. And we remember, Jesus, what you've done for us. We need you, Lord. And I pray as we uh, receive these elements that represent your body and your blood of reconciliation to the world, that you would help us to be reconcilers. We need you. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. So as this song begins, as you're ready, just come and get the elements and then receive them together.
coming. Father, even if Jesus doesn't come back today, Lord, we know that you are coming for the hearts of people. Father, I pray that people would encounter you in this place today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you may be seated. My name is Bjorn, and I'm the associate pastor here at Life Church 360, and we just want to welcome you, whether you're attending in person or online Today is an exciting day because we get to come together and just be a family and do life together. And how we do that is we love God, we invest in others, we faithfully serve, and we encourage the world. It's all about life transformation. It's not about people coming in and just hearing a word, a good word, or enjoying a worship experience. It's about people's lives being transformed. So thank you for being a part of that, being willing to subject yourself to transformation, because that's what Jesus wants for us. So I have a few really important things to say, and a few of those are that we have camps coming up for both youth and the kids this month and August. And it's really important because life transformation happens in those places. I'm one who I spent my life growing up in church, and it was actually in those moments where I was at camp where God really started to tug on my heart and really speak to me and just reveal who he was to me. Um, You know, you can grow up and have someone teach all about what scripture says and who Jesus is, and Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. It's, It's good. But the thing is, is that they have to have that personal encounter with God to have their life transformed. So I encourage you, you can get more information in the lobby. And I believe that they have a few slides up on the screen here. But I want every parent to know that we will do our best to make sure that the kids get to camp. So if you have an issue where finances are tight, please talk to us because we would love to still have your youth and your kids come and be a part. And this morning, we also have just the ability to continue our worship with our tithes and our offerings. It is a continuation of us pouring our hearts out and giving back to God because he is worthy of everything that we can give him. So you can find information on how to give in the seat back in front of you by scanning the QR code, or there are some drop boxes as you walk out these doors, or you can even mail in your offering if that is just easier for you. But I just want to thank you if you have been a faithful giver. You are the reason why this church can do what it does, that it can accomplish its mission. So again, thank you. And I hope that you guys have a great Independence Weekend. Freedom. The power or right to act, speak, or think as one wants without hindrance or restraint. Today we celebrate America. 
We celebrate our independence and our freedom. But as we all know, freedom isn't free. Men and women for centuries have been fighting and giving their lives for our freedoms. Freedoms that we often take for granted. So today, let's intentionally celebrate the things we get to do. We get to be in church. We get to wake up and go to work and provide for our families. We get to listen to any music we like and watch any television shows we want. We have clean water and food at our disposal. This 4th of July, let's celebrate our independence as a nation and as a church, let's declare our dependence on God. Happy Independence Day. Well, tomorrow. <laughs> you know, I want to take a moment and I want to pray uh, for all the people that do help our country continue to be free, and especially for first, first responders and our military personnel uh, and the families that serve and are a part of that. So if you guys would join me, Jesus, we thank you uh, for the men and women who keep our country uh, independent, keep it safe, um, keep it free. And uh, God, I pray for all of them, Lord, they all face so many different things. And uh, this, these last couple years have been so uh, really just militant and crazy over all of the different issues that we've faced, and they face all of it on the front lines. We pray, God, that you would encourage, God, that you would strengthen, you would bless all of our first responders, our police officers, our firefighters, our military personnel. God, we thank you for this country we get to live in and the freedom that we have here. And we just pray your blessing on all those that just serve and uh, give their lives so that we're able to experience what we experience. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, I am so glad that you guys are here this weekend. And uh, we've been talking about just some philosophies that have risen up in the church over these last few years. And it's interesting as a leader in the church, you kind of go, okay, what is the church going to be known for in this kind of time period that we're in? And and I've you know gone through, I've I've been in church now for gosh, 40 years, it's crazy how long I've been in church, and seen different things come and different things go. And like the holiness movement, we've seen hellfire and brimstone. Uh, I, I grew up in Pentecostal churches, so we were kind of like, there was the hyper-Pentecostal movement that kind of happened. Um, there's all kinds of different preaching styles, philosophies, and things that you see come and go in the church. And really, like, really the method of the way we do church is gonna change. Like, I, I've been in church long enough. How many of you guys remember when they did the overhead projector? Like we went from the you know the hymnals to the overhead and like people are like we cannot do overhead projectors that is just not like godly or um, we then we went from overhead projectors to video projectors and uh, flat screen TVs there's video walls now in church there's all kinds of different methods that happen in church um, but the message shouldn't change right the message of Jesus and the reconciliation of Jesus to the Father and how we are to share that with the rest of the world that should never change even though our methods do change and. Over these last few years, we've seen some really aggressive things happen in the church, and they really resonated with me when I started to kind of listen to different people describe what we've been experiencing. And I'm like, you know, as a leader, it's been really difficult to like, okay, how do you describe what's happened and um, really just the, the, the very strong opinions that people have about what's happening in society and how that affects church and how church should be affecting society. And so I thought, okay, I want to look at these four terms that have kind of risen onto the, the scene and, and actually kind of been described. You ever heard it's like when something's going on, you hear it described, you go, yeah, that's kind of what's happening. And I, I really resonated with these four terms and I've been talking about them for the last few weeks. And we talked about uh, the idea of syncretism and syncretism is, is when you take different like philosophies or religious ideas um, or even biblical ideas, and you try to sync them together and say, okay, I'm going to kind of mix and match religion. And you hear people do that all the time. Like they'll kind of say, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Catholic Buddhist. Uh, I, I like the whole Zen thing of being a Buddhist, uh, but I also like the redemption of Catholicism. Or uh, people will say, I'm, I'm a Hindu Baha'i or something. And it's kind of interesting to hear people discuss you know, what they believe and why they believe it. So we talked about syncretism and how really offensive that can be for anyone who decides, okay, you know, I'm actually a Christian, and what does that mean to be a follower of Jesus? Uh, we talked about religious colonialism and how religious colonialism is really 
Um, like we're, we're going to go and infiltrate like uh, a, a different place and say this is who we are and this is what we want you to be and how in the colonial time period that's how they would actually take over different areas and and we've seen some of that happen in religious uh, circles as well. We we talked about uh, Christian paganism, which is what we've been really talking about for the last couple of weeks. And when you when you put the term Christian and pagan together, it it just like it doesn't sound right. You're like that just that's not even possible. I mean nobody would ever do that and. I had never experienced pagan worship, and I'd read about it in the scriptures. Like, you know, okay, we're gonna we're gonna have a calf, we're gonna worship the calf, or uh, there's gonna be an Asherah pole, and you know, what does that mean to worship different Moloch or different gods? In fact, if you're reading the the one year in the Bible right now, we're we're right there looking at the different ways of the kings, and so we're going through uh, First and Second Kings, and you're like going, okay, this king would you know leave this part of worship available for them, or this king would tear down all of that, and you're like going. What is that? Because in America, we don't experience that very much. We don't really experience, okay, the worship of uh, some kind of object. We, we, like, we, we, could, we worship God uh, because America would follow God. And I had never really experienced pagan worship until 2006 when I went to Nepal. And uh, I went to Nepal in, with these missionaries that had been there for many, many years. And they're explaining to us how uh, they worship in the Hindu society. Hindus worship every god. If you never know what Hinduism is, it is the, actually the fear of almost everything. So they worship everything. And so they're going to bow down and say, okay, we want to make sure we make every single god happy. Um, Hindus would say of Christians, well, we are a lot alike because we worship the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so Buddhists would say, well, you guys are more like Hindus because you worship the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, where they only worship one God. We would say, well, we worship one God because he is one, uh, but they wouldn't see us that way. Um, I, I never experienced like worshiping in a, a, a thing or uh, the fear of something. And so we read this book called Under a Peacock Sky, and we had went out into the, like in, deep into Nepal where we actually like trekked out there and I uh, got to experience what it, what it was like to be around people who uh, were, were so afraid of whatever might be out there that would hurt them or bring harm to them that they would worship just about anything. And they would have these shamans, and, and they would perform these different acts of worship. And, and I read this book, and I'm like, this is just, this doesn't seem right to me. Like, it just seems really off. And how could a, a, a person who has intellect even think this way? And, and so I'm out in the middle of Nepal, and and I'm, I'm experiencing like going back in time and what it would be like to, to, to be a person who doesn't understand the world the way maybe I understand it. And, and I, I got to really kind of see like, okay, what would it be like if, if you felt like, okay, my child got sick and I don't know why my child is sick. Now, you and I would go, well, they got sick because of germs. Like, you know, like if you uh, go to the bathroom all over the place, you're going to get sick. And we, we know that because of history in the United States. And they don't even know that. They don't even know they should even wash their hands. They, they don't know how, how that kind of thing happens. So they feel like, okay, my kid got sick, so I need to appease this God if it's out there to help my kid get better. Um, or my cow got sick. Or uh, we don't have any rain, and there's, the crops aren't growing. And they would just kind of worship anything. And um, what paganism is, is the worship of something that is of the world, that something that is in the world, so that you can have your worldly needs met. And I'd heard this idea of Christian paganism, and I thought, that just doesn't even sound like, what would that be? And it is the idea of, I care about this because this provides for what I need here. And I had heard of this talk of, well, we see that happening a lot in the United States right now. And I'm like, well, how? I mean, how, how do we see that? And so you talk about four major things that Christians kind of are, are leaning into, and I, and I see it happening a lot. One of them would be politics, that politics are going to be our answer. If we can just get the right politicians and get the right party in place and, and see the right things happen, then we're going to see you know, Christian ideals happen again in America. Uh, they talked about money and, and just really the, the worship of money. And we're going to talk about money in, in the weeks to come. And uh, they, they talked about different things the way we would say, okay, we, this is what we're going to rely on to provide for us. And I, I looked at that and I thought, you know, we need to talk about this because over these last few years, um, we have seen some very aggressive things happen 
in the church and different philosophies that have risen up about how we would say, okay, I want this to provide uh, for me. I want this to be my answer. And so we started looking at, at politics, and I, I think it's interesting to uh, hear people talk about politics and to see the reaction of people in politics, especially in the church. Like, it's been, uh, to me, very alarming that we would say, hey, this is what matters most, and put a lot of faith and a lot of trust in uh, government. And, and really, we should care about the government. Like, Christians should care about who's in office. We should care about what they think and what they believe. Uh, we should understand the issues that they stand for or don't stand for. Uh, Christians should vote. And historically, we don't have a very good track record of voting, if you didn't know that as Christians. Um, and we should know. And we should actually pay attention to those things. But we shouldn't put our faith and trust in them. Like, okay, this is what's going to save us. This is what's going to be, you know, the, the best thing for America because what is the best thing for America? Yeah. Like, like that's the Christian answer. Like, we're in church. They go, yeah, that's the answer. It's Jesus. It's got to be Jesus and, and the love of Jesus and Jesus bringing us back to the Father. And, and I'm looking at this going, you know, it's interesting that Israel also went through this. Think about, like, never having a king or a president or a governmental leader, and that you rely on God for everything. You know, that's what Israel had. That God was their God. He was going to be their God, and they were going to be his people, and they would rely on God. That God would regulate morality. God would regulate ethics. God would be their protection. Um, God would be their, um, their, their, their source of substance and, and who would provide for them. And he actually would do that. And they would trust him. And at, towards the end of uh, Samuel's life, they were like, you know what? We are afraid. And the reason we're afraid is because Samuel is this prophet who had done miracles. He uh, always led them towards the Lord. And now he's going to die. And his sons, they don't serve God like he does. So they're nervous. And they're thinking, you know what we need? We need a king. We need a king that's going to protect us. We need a king that's going to lead us. We need a king like all of the other countries have. And since they have that protection, we need that as well. And God is like going, well, you know, wait a minute. I've been your provision all along. I've been the one who's always watched after you. I've been the one that has always taken care of you. And they ask Samuel to give them a king. And it's in 1 Samuel 8. And as I looked at this idea of Christian paganism and the putting up of, okay, this is what's important, and if we have this, then we're going to be provided for, I thought of how, how much we are relying on outward sources rather than on the Father. And I see a lot of panic in Christians over politics. I see a lot of panic in Christians over what's going to happen to us instead of, actually, he's our God, and we're his people, and he's going to take care of us, and he has us. And I wanted to look at this again in 1 Samuel chapter 8. It says, they said to him, which is Samuel, uh, you are old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us such as all the other nations have. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord and the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. God says, they're, they're not rejecting you, Samuel. You're following me. They're not rejecting. They are rejecting me. As they have done, verse 8, from the day I brought them out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Remember, we looked at last week, in, as, as they were out in the wilderness, Moses is up on Mount Sinai. He's getting the Ten Commandments, and they say, hey, Aaron, make us a god. And so Aaron shapes this calf, and they said, this is our God who brought us out of Egypt. This is the you know, God we're going to worship. And, and, and God's like, going. they've done that ever since the very beginning. For some reason, we are kind of like driven to find something we can hold on to rather than God, because we don't see God. We don't have God right in our presence as far as physical. And so we kind of tend to rely on something else. He says, now listen to them. 
but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, this is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to the commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest, and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and give and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your male and female servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then then we will be like all the other nations with the king to lead us and to go out before us and to fight our battles. When Samuel heard all that the people said, he repeated it before the Lord. The Lord answered, listen to them and give them a king. Israel wanted a man who would represent them and fight their battles and be their defense. Now, could you imagine if you're God and you led these people across the Red Sea and you fed them in the wilderness and you provided everything that they needed, you confused their enemies before them and went ahead of them and behind them and around them and you were their provision and they said, you know what? We need a man. We need a man that's going to protect us because, you know, God, we can't really see you. You're not with us. You don't have skin on, so we can't rely on you. We need something beyond you. And how offensive. And God says, Samuel, they're not rejecting you. They are rejecting me. And it's interesting that today we, we see groups of people putting their trust and their faith in a political party. As if, if, if we have the right political party in office or they have the majority of the House or they have the majority of the Supreme Court or they have this and we're going to have what we want and God will win. As if God can't win on his own. As, as if we couldn't say, you know, God, We know that you're the king of kings and you're the Lord of lords and you're the one that is in charge of not just our country, but the entire world. And we trust you. You are our provision. You are our protection. God, we can trust you 100%. And we see such panic and hear it in people's voices and in their posture towards one another. It's been a really interesting time to lead in the church because of the extreme ideas and how upset people get over the different issues. And what's really interesting is it's not even just the, okay, we're all, you know, red or we're all blue, you know, or or we're all left and we're all right. Actually, even within the party, we're divided. Like, you know, I mean, like, you know, okay, well, well this party is saying, you, you know, you have to wear a mask, but we don't want to do that part, but, you know, or we do want to do that part, but we don't agree with the rest of their stuff, or, or we do agree with this part, but we don't agree, and we, and we just have this constant, ugh. Have you ever had a relationship broken that you wanted fixed? I mean, and it bothers you. Like, it, it weighs on you. Where you, it's like, I, I really, I miss this relationship with this person. I would do anything to fix that relationship. Have you ever felt that way? I mean, now here's the deal. If you're a parent and you have a child that is estranged, you go, yeah, I get it. You totally understand this. You're like, I would do anything to help this relationship be repaired. 
I don't care what it would cost. I don't care what I would have to do. I don't know how I can say sorry enough. I don't know how to bring this thing back together because every time I try, it somehow gets just separated. Well, Jesus told this ridiculous story once. He said, you know how a farmer, you know, has 100 sheep and one of them gets away and he'll leave the 99 to go get the one and they're like going, what? You're going to leave the 99 to go find one? Yeah, I'm going to leave 99 to go find one. Yeah, but the 99 will be at risk. I, I know. But this one is so important. That's how much I love. That's how much I care. And I wonder today, what's the church going to be known for today? Because this is our time. If you think about it, historically, this is our time. In, in 25 years, in 50 years, they're going to talk about us. They're going to talk about what we were like. What was the church like in, in you know, that, that 2000 era? Remember the whole Y2K thing? And then, you know, we moved through that and made it. Woo, finally, we made it through Y2K. And now we're, you know, through COVID, we think. And, you know, it's like, what, what are they going to say about the church today? Will we represent Jesus? Will they go, you know, man, those guys, they really tried to bring the community together. They really tried as hard as they could to, to help people who are really far away from God know who God is and have a relationship with God and, and be reconciled. In fact, they really bridged that gap. They, they were the kind of people that like, they got right in the middle of things and they held the hand to the other side, even though they may not have agreed completely with the other side, and they helped the two sides come together under the leader and the Lord of their life. We have two yellow lines going down the auditorium. You know what double yellow is, right? You don't cross the double yellow. It's very interesting that today, that we won't even help another person because they have a different thought than we have about the way something should go. They're on the other side of the line that we would be on. And we're, and we're being told today, which is just really interesting, that if we disagree, we don't like each other. And we shouldn't like each other, and we should stay as far away from each other as possible because we are very far apart. We're not even close. We're, we're so far apart, and, and we really should, you know, make sure they know just how different we are and how upset we are. It's, it's like there, there really isn't a middle ground anymore. It's just... Boom. I thought it'd be fun since it's 4th of July. Did you guys get any of these on your way in the door? These are, these are uh, stress balls. Go ahead. You just, oh, man, let it out right there. Doesn't that just make you... I don't feel any better at all. I can squish this all day long. I don't feel any better at all. <laughs> I don't know why it's not helping me, okay? Uh, but I thought it'd be kind of fun. You remember when it would rain and it's raining for 4th of July? We're going out to Tina's parents' cabin after this and we're going to be in the rain with our family in a cabin. Okay, uh, pray for us. Um, but uh, remember when it would rain in elementary school and the PE teacher didn't want to go outside and they'd say, you know what we're going to do today? We're going to stay in the gym and we're going to play Soak'em. Remember Soak'em? Soak'em is where there's a line down the middle of the room and you throw the ball at the other people. And if you hit them, it's dodgeball. It's kind of dodgeball, except for when you hit them, if they catch it, you're out. You have to sit down. If 
they hit you and you don't catch it, then you're out and you have to sit down. Um, but if somebody on your team catches one of the balls, it's going to, then they can let one of you back in. And um, what we're going to do is uh, on, on the right side over here, this is the south side. It's not the right side. It's the south side, okay? <laughs> it's not the donkey. It's not, it's not the elephant, all right? It's not red. It's, not, it's the south, okay? Just get it. It's the south, okay? It's the south because it's south, okay? And then this is the, the north side, all right? It's, it's, again, it's not red. It's, not, it's just north, okay? Um, so it, it's, it's actually north and south. Um, so that's north and that's south. And so, so, so that's what we're going to do. We're just, you're going to go with me on it. We're just going to, okay, okay. And <laughs> these represent your opinions, okay? And uh, your opinion, now you need to understand that because we represent to society today, nobody can be in the middle. You're not in the middle. Um, you can't cross the yellow line. Uh, you can go get balls, but you can't go on the other side. Um, but you're going you're gonna to congregate to the extreme, okay, because we don't want anyone getting hurt at least not permanently. So um, <laughs> for the weekend, it's not that big a deal. But you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna congregate over here. The, you, you Southers, you're going to be over here. And you Northers, are gonna, and you have your opinions. And your opinions are all that matter is right here, OK? And you are going to make sure they understand your opinion, if you understand what I'm talking about. And you're going to knock these guys out. So we're going to have you guys gather over here, right over here. You guys gather over here. And you guys gather over here. Ready? Go ahead and gather over here. We're going to get ready. And you guys are going to knock people out. Do you have your balls? Your stress balls. That's their foam. All right. Now, you can come up to the middle, but you cannot cross the middle. And if you get hit, you must sit down. And you must be honest. We're going to find out people's integrity here. Um, if you catch a ball, you get to release one of your players back into the game. And on your mark... Look at Bud. He's like, he's on it. Okay. You're that guy in tennis that plays the net. Okay. I see how you are. On your mark. Get set. Knock him out. Boom. Gotcha. Oh, oh, he caught it. You're out. You got to sit down. Get him back in. Come on. Bean him. You got to go harder than that. Whoa. Knock him out. There's a lot in the middle. Come on, someone's got to catch him, bring him back in the game. Get him. Oh, Connie's done. Look at her with a knee. She's going after her. Come on, catch something. This side's almost done. You guys are killing them. This side is almost done. Come on, we need some going here, quicker. There's balls in the middle. You, ha you can't, you're out. <laughs> Tina, that is weak. Get him. <laughs> 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. I think, I believe that the South has clearly won. The South has risen. Give each other a huge hand. All right. Is, is this what we want? Well, oh, I almost had it. Is this what we want the church to be known for? Well, it was fun. It, it is fun. It is fun. But... In our day, when they talk about us, our grandchildren, and they talk about this era that we've lived through, and, and I mean, we're talking historic stuff, like deep historic stuff. Like, we, we're, we're the COVID people. We're the ones that led the country through the 100-year pandemic. Like, th th there's going to be a lot of stuff about what is going to be said about the church today, and what do we trust in and what are we known for? Especially after June 24th, 2022. You guys know what happened on June 24th, 2022? Yeah, the whole Roe v. Wade thing. Oh, yeah, that thing. Yeah, that thing. 
And, and very interesting because it, it's the federal government has overturned the, the, the abortion on demand, which has now made 52 different debates happen um, all around the country because, you know, we all know that federal law and state law are two very different things. I don't know how that works, but it's the way it works now. And, and we have this whole thing happening, and we see some people saying, we won, and other people saying, we lost. My, my daughter had somebody come through the, the coffee stand. She's a, a barista and uh, is refusing to celebrate Independence Day because uh, this person feels like their liberty has been taken from them. And uh, they don't feel like they're free anymore in the country. And I uh, wanted to make that very known to, to, to my daughter. And, and my daughter was like, yeah, that's interesting to me. That everybody's opinion today is, is so extreme. And I've entitled today's message, what is the Christian job description? What is our, you know what a job description is, right? Like everyone who's had a job, even if you didn't get one written, you know that you had a job description because they trained you in your job when you got your job. A job description is, this is what you're going to have to do. If you want to stay gainfully employed at this place, then this is what you do here. Right? It's, your, it's an understanding of, hey, this is what you need, this is what you want, if I do this, then I stay employed here, and this is what I can do. What is the Christian job description? What did Jesus say that we would be? What are we supposed to be all about? And, and I could take you to lots of different places in Scripture, but wait, we could just kind of do a little bit of Christianese here and talk about, like, Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He didn't say, I'm going to make you hunters of men, right? Where you just, you know, you pick the game and you blow it away. It's fishing. It's attractional. Fishing is very attractional. You're going to attract the fish. They're going to want to be a part of what you're doing. So if you follow me, you're going to now fish for men. He, they had followed Jesus for a very short time and Jesus sent them out. How did he send them out? Two by two. They're in relationship, right? So they're going to go and they're going to talk to people about this idea that Jesus has come. The Messiah that we talked about, he's here. The kingdom of God is near. He said, go tell them the kingdom of God is near. And they actually got more followers. In fact, there were 72 of them. And what did he do with the 72? Sent them out two by two. Like, like it's, it, it wasn't bait and switch. Jesus had always said, you follow me, make you a fisher of men. Oh, by the way, go. Yep, we've got some people. They came. Yep, now you guys are going to go as well. In Matthew 28, 18, he said, go into... No, I think what he meant was, go to people that are like you, that you can agree with, <laughs> uh, and, you know, and it would affirm what you think, and get together and sing songs and memorize scripture. But he didn't do that, Right? Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples. In Acts chapter 1, he said, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses where? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. He's going to send us to people that are not like us, that are very different from us. The apostle Paul he was a very zealous Pharisee. He was killing and imprisoning Christians. And he has this dynamic encounter with Jesus, and he's so transformed by Jesus that he becomes one of the greatest voices for Jesus of all time. In fact, he, read, he wrote a third of the New Testament, and in 2 Corinthians, he writes this. this he, he gives us our job description. He says, for Christ's love compels us. He didn't write, the differences of Jesus compels us. He's so much different than everybody else. That's what's going to compel us is our differences. We're going to go out and, you know, he says his love, it compels us. Because we are convinced that one died for, well, the people that agree, okay? And, and therefore, all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. 
All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. What's the ministry? We're the reconcilers. That God has reconciled the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Do you, do you know how you like gain a following and, and support and, and, and garner, like even raise money? Is you have to convince people that they're losing. If I can convince you you're losing and I can get far, far, far south or far, far, far north and say, we're losing to the north and we must do something. And if you fund me, if you'll support me, we will win. I will not let that happen. That's how you gain support. And so people congregate. They've got their opinion and they've got their power with all of their group of people. And it's like that they're, they're in these foxholes together and they're hurling these grenades at the other side or they're just, every once in a while someone's got this big bazooka and they stand up with their party and they just start blasting somebody. That's not reconciliation. See, nothing gets solved out here. Where does it get solved? Here. In the middle. Now, can you have an opinion? You bet you can have an opinion, you guys. It's how you have your opinion. As a reconciler, and last week I, I felt very compelled to share where I stand with being somebody who is pro-life. And I, I felt like I had to share it because I just, it's, it was such a big deal. It's monumental that this is happening. And it's like, I've got to share. I, I don't want to be known for the other side of that. At the same time, I don't want to condemn somebody who's ever had that happen in their life. Because I know I'm not the judge. Like scripture says in John 5, for as the father has life in himself, so he has granted the son also to have life in himself. And he's given him authority to judge because he's the son of man. So I know I'm not the judge, right? Like Christians aren't the judge. Jesus is the judge. He even warns us not to judge people, says if we, we're going to judge, we're going to be judged the way we judge other people. And, and I also know that I'm not the conviction. Like, I'm not the one who convicts the world of sin. I, I mean, in fact, there's a job description for that one too, and Jesus said it in John 16. But in fact, it's best for you that I go away because if I don't, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you, and when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. The world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. So the Christian job description is to be a reconciler. Jesus' job description is to save and then judge, right? And then the Holy Spirit's is to convict. If I try to play the, the, the whole judge one, I, I'll, best I can do is condemn. If I try to play the conviction card, then the best I'm going to do is guilt and shame. So as a reconciler, how do we as reconcilers have an opinion, but yet reconcile? Because a lot of Christians feel like, you know, if I don't have an opinion, then there's something wrong with me. I'm, I'm, I'm lukewarm. You know, that, that whole scripture, which is not what that's talking about. But people try to use that one. Like, and if I don't tell you that I'm against it, then, then you're going to think I'm for it, which I felt that pressure last week. Like, I got to share something like that. It's like, how do you have an opinion? Well, here's the deal. It's, it's we, we're here. I'm here. And, and I share this with, with just humility and love. The, the reason that I, I am, you know, pro-life is because Psalm 139, 13. It, it says, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. 
So I take that as, okay, God is doing something right at there in, in the womb. And so what I'm going to do is I'm not going to go over here and, and, and hurl insults or, or, or hurl condemnation or judgment. I'm going to stand right here in the middle, and I, I'm just going to go. I know what I'm not supposed to be here, but I'm, I'm here. And, and gosh, I just love all of you. I care about everyone here. And, and I can't even imagine what that would be like. And, and I just want you to know how much God loves you and God cares about you and, and that I love you and the church loves you and we care about you. And you know, I just want you to know that you have a friend, whether you believe what I believe or don't believe what I believe, and I believe that God can convince you I don't need to do that. That you can have a, a conviction, you can have something, but you go, you know, as a reconciler, I'm going to reconcile. Because here's the thing, if you have a son or daughter and they are not like with you, and they're like, you know, you're going to be very careful, right? If you actually got an audience with them and you got to actually be in the same room with them, you'd be very careful what you said, right? Because you just know it's going to take just one thing and this thing's going to be off, right? It's just going to be just World War V out here. It's like going to be crazy. And I can go, no, you know, no, I'm going to make sure. You know, I don't know about you guys, but Tina, we'll, we'll like even have a conversation like, okay, uh, this is probably going to come up. So let's, uh, what are we going to say when that comes up? Because you know what's coming up, right? What if we as Christians go, you know, I know this is going to come up. But God gave me this job description to reconcile the world to him. I can't imagine what it would be like to be a dip. I'm so not diplomatic. I am the worst diplomat ever. <laughs> Could you imagine being a, a diplomat of a country where you go into another country and, and you're going to try to bring these two sides that are ready to go to war with each other together? And how the diplomacy it would take to do that. Like, it's like, oh God, give me wisdom. And as we look at Independence Weekend and we, we talk about our independence and, and we talk about our freedom and how God has given our country favor and, and we thank God for that and we remember that. What if we were to say, God, would you help us? Would you help us be people who can, it's okay to live here in the double yellow? It's okay. Help me to hold the hand of other people so they could know you. You brought me to you. Do you know that God has changed my mind about so many things? <laughs> You're like going, yeah, I got I relate that. If he could change our mind, couldn't he change somebody else's? It's crazy that we think, well, if the government mandated it, then it's gonna actually happen. Does anybody really believe that? I mean, it's great to have policy. It's great to have, you know, ethics. It's great to have, you know, more morality there. And, 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 all, and, and even great to have some punitive things about, like, if you don't do this. And, you know, like, there's some great reform that has happened I'm very thankful for. Like the abolition of slavery, for one. There's a lot of Christians who didn't want that to happen. I'm so thankful that happened, right? That's a good thing. That there's, there's actually punishment for people who enslave other people. But that's not what's actually making morality happen in the heart. Right? Evil people will be evil. Who takes care of that? Yeah, our King of Kings and our Lord of Lords. Not the government. Not the king. I think it's important that we recognize, okay, the government is important. but he's not him. Our God is on the throne. Whether America is number one, two, three, ten, I don't know where we're at in the line anymore, or not. What if Christians could just relax and say, God, you're our king. We are following you. Please have your way and give us the courage and the strength to stand in the middle and love people who are at opposite sides of the room. 
and hold their hand in the middle of all this discomfort and pain. The reason why people don't do this is because it's hard. That's why they go to the extremes. It's easy. I want to pray that we as a church would hold the hand of our community and bring the community back together and rely on Jesus. Not a policy, not a governmental order, but on Jesus. And we'd be okay with discomfort. I, I, I have to close the message because Christine is playing and it means I'm done. <laughs> I literally, I've wrestled with this message all week. I'm, I've been uncomfortable all week long. And the reason why is because this is uncomfortable. This, there's, there's no way to send you out comfortable. This just is uncomfortable. You'll be uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> but I do believe it is what we're called to do. And I pray that we do it well. So, Father, I pray that you would help us to be comfortable with the uncomfortable. I pray that you'd help us to never sit in the seat of judgment or to act as if we can convict the world of its transgressions. But we would rely on you because you are God and you are not just God, you are our God. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords and we put our faith and our trust in you and we ask you, Jesus, to change our hearts the way they need to be changed towards you and to help us to draw other people to you and to love you and not rely on worldly things to give us our worldly desires, but we rely on you for everything. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, uh, that message, I remember hearing it um, in our meeting, and I know it's a hard message for Pastor Matt to give, but as I study the scriptures myself, I, you look at Jesus. Jesus was the peacemaker. And if he calls us to be disciples, that means that we follow him. So I just sing the song, Another Fire, remember that in these uncomfortable times we're in now as a church family, that we'll rely on Jesus. He will carry us to those fires. I know I'll never 